Self Reliance The Pepper Broadcasting Network. We have to hit the reset button and create a true culture of preparedness starting at a very young age and filtering all the way up. Welcome to the Gunmetal Armory. Here's your host, Dane D. What's up, everybody? This is Dane from the Gunmetal Armory. I hope everybody's having a great holiday. Um, I know I had a great Christmas and a really, really uh, great New Year. Um, I hope everybody out there did as well. Got some things that I've been needing for a long time and some things that I've been wanting for a really long time as well. Um... One of the things that I wanted was a grain mill, and I actually got one of those from the Mistress of Metal herself, so that was really, really cool. Um, anyways, so last, uh, probably about two weeks ago, maybe two and a half weeks ago, we were talking about uh, the, you know, World War II and how the Resistance worked and, you know, the things that the Resistance would do. Um, when it came to sabotage and demolitions, um, mainly when it came to the demolitions of um, objects and structures like bridges, um, things of that nature. How was this done? How was it carried out? What areas of those bridges would need to be, um, you know, set up to bring down that bridge, you know, during World War II. So we were talking about that a couple of weeks ago when I was on. And I was doing my best to describe to everyone on the podcast exactly where the resistance would place charges and how they would blow these bridges or, you know, structures or whatever. Um, but one thing that I realized in doing this is I can describe to you what the bridge looks like and what the supports look like, what the shape of the supports are like and where they would place the charges, you know, back in the day. But if you're not looking at the same picture I'm looking at, it could be extremely difficult for me to get this across to you. So what I think I'm going to do is um, occasionally when we're tackling subjects like this, um, such as how the resistance operated during World War II, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to start doing a video series, a couple of videos here and there, maybe... Maybe multiple videos, you know, on how the resistance operated. And we'll go through some of the um, archive sources that I have. Um, We'll go through some of the manuals that I have. We'll talk about demolitions. We'll talk about, you know, how the knife work was done. We'll talk about, you know, the, the close combat tactics. And there's just so many things that we can cover. Um... Uh, on on a video you know there's just so many things that we can cover on video that once you guys see it visually it will make a whole lot more sense to you so i'm going to go ahead and do that um i'm obviously you know i i obviously i don't tell you guys everything that i do in my life but it is pretty busy right now however Um, there are going to be times where I do have time to do that kind of stuff. So, um, I think maybe next week I'll film the first video. Um, I'll get it up online for you guys and maybe the first one will be on, you know, World War II resistance and demolitions. How did they do it? Where did they do it? Uh, what kind of bridge structures would they go after and how would they, you know, take those bridges down, so on and so forth. 
um, you know, purely for a historical perspective. That's that's what I'm doing there. So, um, anyways, I don't have a ton of time today, but um, I do want to go over some more information about the resistance and you know World War II and how this stuff was done back then. Um, I'm going to try to stay on with you guys for as long as I can. Um, the other thing that I want to tell you guys is I'm trying to monetize my YouTube channel. And if I can get my YouTube channel monetized, I can do those YouTube live broadcasts and be able to talk to you guys directly while I'm doing them. So if someone had a question, you know, say about, you know, the Marine Raider dagger versus the Fairburn Sykes dagger versus the V-42 dagger versus the OSS dagger, on and on and on. If you have any questions, you know, about this type of stuff, you know, whatever it may be, you know, within the rules and confines of, you know, a shithole like YouTube, um, we can do that. I'm also going to be looking into other platforms like rumble and odyssey and some of the other ones and see what's possible see if i can um get on there and do live streams so you guys can ask me about um world war ii stuff and you know questions about that stuff so um you know of course modern combatives too you know we can we can discuss all that stuff and you know kind of brainstorm together and see you know what 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 a modern resistance maybe look like uh, you know it's an interesting thoughts interesting question i mean some people like to look at the movies for that kind of stuff you know like red dawn and the second iteration of red dawn which was nowhere near as good as the first um you know, they like to look at the movies for their information. But I'm sorry. That has no... I mean, they're... Eh, I don't know. I, I just don't think that that has any significant bearing on real life. Whereas, if you look at the resistances that were formed in World War II... The French resistance, you know, the Norwegian resistance, the Polish resistance, all these different groups that fought back against the Nazi occupation. Well, that paints a very different picture. Okay? This was real. These people were getting captured. They were parachuting behind enemy lines. They were doing all kinds of demolition missions, assassination missions, sabotage missions. I mean, this was the real freaking deal. Not some stupid Hollywood movie, okay? Nothing against Red Dawn. I like Red Dawn, the first one. You know, nothing against that. I'm just saying, if you want actual information on how a group like that, you know, would operate or how a group like that may have operated back in the day, look into history, dude, not movies. Anyways, I I had a discussion with somebody that I knew, you know, a couple of weeks ago about, you know, how Red Dawn was, you know, according to him, was pretty realistic. I'm like, no. <laughs> no. No, 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 no. Anyways, <laughs> I'm sure some of you out there will get a laugh out of that one. Um, anyways, and like every movie, of course, there were some parts that, you know, had some bearing in reality. Okay, yeah, those are probably the kind of guns that a backwoods, you know, couple of backwoods dudes would have. Yeah, they'd have a hunting rifle. Of course, they'd resupply off of people in the area. Sure, sure, sure. Whatever. Anyways, let's move on. So, uh, a couple of weeks ago, before we were talking about demolitions and things like that, you know, for the resistance, we were talking about the organization of resistance groups. The organizations uh, of <clears throat> how those groups would operate, okay? Okay. So, in each of those groups, they would prepare for any kind of operation that they were going to undertake. One of the biggest operations back during World War II was, of course, going to be D-Day. You know, that was their zero day. That was D-Day. Okay? Um, but all of the resistance cells were preparing for that. 
Now, none of them knew when D-Day was coming because if they were compromised, of course they could tell, right? But they knew that it was going to come at some point, just like you know Hitler and the Nazis knew that there was going to be an invasion at some point. They just didn't know when, okay? Now, back in the day, you know, the resistance forces, they they would generally, you know, depending on the size of the group, they would organize a special, you know, team to handle those kinds of operations, to, to handle the, um, the, I don't want to call it, you know, D-Day or Zero Day or whatever, but, I, well, whatever. Um, they would, they would basically a special unit that would organize what's going to happen for the days up leading up to that big operation. Okay. Um, sometimes that special section, that special organization would deal with getting everything together, getting all the weapons together, getting the plan together. How is this resistance group going to aid the allies during the D day invasion, right? How are they going to aid the larger force? Okay, and not get killed, right? But, quite often, the leader of that resistance group would plan to switch his normal resistance group, not the special organization, or not the special unit that he put in charge of preparing for that invasion, his entire group, okay? Sometimes he would switch his entire group into that role as soon as the invasion hit. Okay, so his entire resistance cell would become that special group, that unit, or he would just, you know, basically kind of assimilate both into the same group. And everybody, all hands on deck, everybody is helping the Allies with that invasion, okay? So, that's kind of an interesting thing to look at there, and kind of an interesting thing to think about. Um, let's see. There, there, There's a lot of emphasis placed on communications and methods of communication, um, security during communication, but that needs to be a major focus of any kind of group like that, right? Of any kind of group of resistance, security should supersede pretty much everything, okay? That is, it has to be, it has to be, okay? Um, now, it depends on how close you're getting to an operation that's, you know, that big. Like, if you've got a D-Day operation, then you may not have time to set up cutouts and dead drops and things like that. You may just have to put key personnel in, in touch with each other. If you've got, you know, Bob in one town and Jim in the other, and they need to know each other, and they need to communicate with each other to, you know, get... I don't know, the French resistance or whoever, ready for the D-Day invasion, well, you can't keep using a cutout. You can't keep using dead drops. You have to put them in touch with each other. Okay? But there are ways to do that and do that safely as well. And we could talk about cutouts on another time. It's not, not difficult at all. The other thing that we need to talk about, too, at some point, is <clears throat> having... Um, Basically having people in reserve to take over specific uh, jobs, okay? Key positions, specific jobs. Um, they would need to keep in mind that it's always possible that their enemy, you know, the Nazis, that they would know more about that resistance group than the leader thinks, they know about, okay? The leader of that resistance group may not know just how much the bad guys know, okay? 
Um, and, you know, the Gestapo or, you know, Nazi secret police, whatever you want to call them, they may not try to round up that resistance cell until the day before D-Day. You know, they may wait and wait and wait and listen. And if they already know where they are, if they've already compromised one of those resistance members, they may wait until an hour, you know, five minutes before, um, you know, a massive operation to come in and, and get everybody, right? So it's important that those resistance groups have men in reserve to take over those key positions if someone gets caught or someone gets in a drunken brawl or whatever, okay? Now, the other thing that they'll need to worry about too is if you're going to have any kind of, you know, uh, anything to do with the war, if you're going to be helping the Allies, if you're going to be resisting in any way, and this goes for pretty much everything, you're going to have to arrange signals that, you know, deviate, that, that, that denote action and recognition too. You're going to have to have the, uh, the code words, right? Or those call signs or whatever you want to call them. Um, for example, I was watching a, um, it was a documentary on the Black Watch, you know, one of the, uh, Canadian units, the Black Watch. Kind of reminds me of the Night's Watch from, uh, Game of Thrones. Stupid show. Um, anyways, it was a, um, Canadian team or Canadian, uh, military unit called the Black Watch. And I was watching a documentary on the snipers that operated inside the Black Watch. And there was a point where they were on a night patrol, just two of them, on a night patrol. And they came back to base. And there were some, you know, foreign guards. You know, the Canadian forces worked with a lot of different countries. And this is during World War II. And these guards were like, what's the password? And the uh, the foreign guards went steamer, and the black watch guys they couldn't remember the word they were supposed to say back. Generally, when it comes to code words like that, you have a challenge, you have a challenge word, and you have the password like um, base, and then ball, you know, or mom and dad, you know, or just you know two things that may or may not go together, you know, shoes and socks, whatever. Right, so their their code word, their password was trunk. So the so the guards said steamer, and they said um, case, uh, briefcase, um, suitcase, um, box. Uh, they could not think of the word trunk. <laughs> so finally, you know, before they got shot, they had to pull out their uh, the berets that they wear. These black watch guys wear black berets with red feathers in them. And they always carry them with them, even on even on patrol. Well, they had to pull out their red berets with this feather, or these black berets with the red feather in them, and show these guards, like, "Hey, wait, 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 we're Black Watch, we're Black Watch, don't shoot." So, anyways, um, you're going to need to come up with recognition signals like that, so your guys know who's who. You know, especially if you got guys coming back to your OP, you know, or your HQ or whatever, and, you know, you need to be able to identify them, okay? That, that At least that's how I think they would have done it back in the day. Um, these guys also would have had to pay quite a bit of attention to how much material they had and how much they were collecting. It's very, very important that they would have paid attention to that. How many guns do they have? How much ammo do they have? You know, how much, you know, things like that do they have in their arsenal? How much, you know, uh, let's say first aid supplies do they have? You know, all of this stuff comes into play when they're getting ready to do, you know, an invasion like D-Day. Okay. 
So somebody is going to have to keep track of all of that stuff and exactly how much of that stuff there is. Okay. So the next thing that we're going to talk about is the security rules. Okay. There is specific rules that have to be followed when it comes to security. So every member of that resistance cell needs to needs to be trained in self defense they need to be they need to know how to defend themselves they need to know how to use firearms they need to know how to use edge weapons they need to know how to use all kinds of different stuff because um protecting yourself may you may not you may not have a chance to say no Okay, so you need to know how to do it. Not to mention the possibility of unlawful captivity. You know, that was a big, big problem back in the day, you know. So they need to know how to handle that stuff. And um, everybody in the group needs to know what the rules are as far as security goes. Everybody's got to know that stuff. Um, one thing that was stressed during World War II in the resistance cells was that every member of a resistance cell generally had a job, a special job. You know, let's say Bob did demolitions and James was a gunsmith and Frank, you know, he's a quartermaster and... Bobby over there, you know, he he was a cook, okay? But in being assigned that job, you if you were in that resistance cell, you were absolutely barred from taking on any other job or taking on any more duties. Okay? they used to say that it can become extremely dangerous for someone to try to take on too much work, try to do too much. Okay? The other danger that they would run into is someone saying that they know how to do something and that they don't, you know? So what if you've got, you know, Bob over here, or let's say James, let's go back to James. No no offense to the owner of PBN, you know, I'm not saying him. Um... But let's say James the gunsmith, you know, I was talking about James being the gunsmith, okay? Let's say that he does not know how to work on guns, okay? But yet he volunteered for that job. Well, (laughs) if he doesn't know anything, I'm sorry, but (laughs) things can go very wrong very fast when you're dealing with tolerances and you're dealing with, you know, something as strong and as violent as gunpowder so it's absolutely imperative that these resistance cell members would stick to their job and it's extremely important that the um, the leader of the resistance the guy that you know is leading the group, it's extremely important that he keep those guys in line and he picks the right person for the right job. You know, if, you know, Mr. Carvel over there, you know, if he is good with explosives and he used to do mining and things like that, you know, rock mining or mining for gemstones, he knows how dynamite works, knows how all that stuff works. He's probably the best guy for the demolition side of things, you know. Just something to think about. Anyways, um, the next thing, this is a big one. They were all instructed to make sure that they never attempted to find out more about the resistance cell than they were told. So, let's say you have a meeting with 
the members of that cell, right? And you got Jason over here, and he's like, hey, man, is this everybody in the cell? Is this everybody? Or are there more people in the group? Are there more people in our resistance group? Because I, I only see five people here. Are there more? Where do we keep our weapons? You know, do we have any explosives? Where do we keep the ammunition? Are we going to be having any training? Are we going to help the allies when they land? You know, crap like that, dude. They would be on the lookout for those kind of people. People trying to learn way too much, way too fast. Okay? They are very particular about, you know, people who are trying to use up and find out more about that group. Way, way more. Okay? Now keep in mind, you know, if you're a courier, if you know, if the if the courier of that group he is gonna have to know some people to take messages around or take equipment or gear or whatever around. Yeah. He's gonna have to know some things. He's gonna have to know some people. Okay. But it doesn't mean that he's gotta know more than he's been told. Okay. So the other the next thing is each member of the organization they need to know which names are being used for each member. Okay? So like I was saying, you got Jason, you got Bob, you got James, you know, I don't know, you got Phil. <laughs> Philip. Um, you got Joe. I don't know. Whatever. Okay? Let's just say these aren't their real names. Okay? Surely you can't be serious. Let's just say these aren't their real names. Okay? Um, that's okay. Okay. But that being true, everyone in the organization needs to stick with those names. Okay. Especially if, let's say, you're recruiting people that are in your family or you're recruiting close friends, but everyone changes their name. Well, everybody's got to stick to those names because if they don't and somebody that's in your group call somebody by a different name which is their real name and someone's around to hear it that could be very bad very very bad okay anyways um one tip on that too that they would give is to use common names you know like I was saying Joe John Jim You know, very, very common names. I don't know why they all happen to start with a J, but forget it. Um, Another thing that they would, like, really, really frown upon would be members of the Resistance um, carrying weapons. Okay? Now, let me clarify that, okay? Because I know that we all have this romantic vision of a resistance fighter with his lapel dagger and blah, 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 right? What I'm getting at here, and what I think that they talk about in some of the documents I've read, are members, you know, the members of that resistance group, they're generally not supposed to carry arms. And when they say arms, I believe that they mean fire arms, okay? Knives are one thing, especially if it's like a hunting knife or something. You carry that on your belt back in the day and nobody's going to say a word because a lot of people had them. Or what about like a small, excuse me, a small uh, pocket knife or something. Like almost everybody had pocket knives back in the day. You know, hell, I've still got three of them on me right now. So one thing they would talk about in these documents is, you know, members not carrying arms unless they're in a situation where they can have no cover story, okay? Your cover story is worth more than a firearm to a spy, to a resistance fighter, to someone who operates behind enemy lines. Your cover story is worth way more than that Silence 22, you know, or whatever firearm you happen to have, okay? 
being able to talk your way out of a situation and not create a bunch of bodies that are going to get investigated and, you know, loud or not loud gunshots, things like that, it is much, much better to not draw attention than it would be to draw attention. Now, if you're one of these resistance fighters and you're out in the middle of a field at night waiting on an airdrop from the British, how do you explain that? You know, you got a couple of candles out there, a couple of lights out there, one at one end of the runway and one at the other end where they're supposed to drop that package for you, right? How do you explain that if the Gestapo catches up with you? Well, that might be a case where you definitely need to have a gun, you know, if, if that was the case back in the day, right? But... Sometimes, sometimes those groups, you know, they go out in a few guys and they would take some sheep with them or some cattle with them or whatever, right? They've got animals with them and they're just driving them back to the farm. That's all they're doing, you know? It's, uh, they just happen to get stuck out there later at night than they thought because they were looking for one of their lost sheep. You know, they can be explained. It can be explained. So, um, another thing that they would talk about that was extremely important is members of each organization not speaking to each other. Okay? So, I don't know if you guys remember a few shows back where I was going over the resistance cell structure, okay? Um, but I'll do it real quick for you, okay? So you've got one agent that is dropped behind the enemy lines, World War II style, you know, ha-ha, fun, fun, okay? He makes contact with a local resistance cell. Let's say that's two guys, okay? So now there's three. You got an agent and you got two guys in the resistance, Okay? Then, one guy from that three-man team, just one guy from that three-man team, goes out and uses some of the hunches he's heard about, or uses information from the Allies or whatever, and he makes contact with another person who wants to resist, okay? And that person has a few people that they trust, so, the first group of men, the three people, right, the agent and the two resistance members, that's group A, okay? One guy from group A forms group B. One guy from group B forms group C. One guy from group C forms group D. And on and on it goes. So, only one person from each group knows the next group, okay? Now, there is a different way to do this that is way less secure, but it creates a force extremely fast. It creates, basically it creates a small army, okay? So, let's go back to group A. You've got the agent, the drop behind enemy lines, and you've got the two resistance members, okay? So, instead of just one guy from group A recruiting group B, you've got all three members of group A that recruit one person or a few people, okay? And then each of those people that they've recruited recruits someone. And then each of those people that those people recruited recruit someone. So you can see that, you know, group A is three people. Group B will be, let's say, six people. And then group C will be 12. And then group um, D will be 24. And then group E will be 48. You see, it gets exponentially bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And as long as you... Um, 
as long as you know they would hold strong to their uh, security practices and do their best to maintain security there's a high chance that they would be okay depending on how soon they would uh, initiate any operations okay but keep in mind that the most secure way to do it is one person from each group recruiting and building another group. Okay. Now that doesn't mean that he stays with that group. Generally that guy is going to go back to his original group after he has formed the new group. Okay. Just keep that in mind. Like for example, if it was the agent that was dropped behind enemy lines from group A that recruited men for group B he would go back to group A as soon as he was done training and building group B and so on okay so the dangers of contacting other cells other groups um, is that they may have already been compromised by any kind of enemy okay but your guys will never know that. And that's why they it's so dangerous for them to contact those other groups. You know, if, if it is essential to do that, generally, you know, during World War II, they would talk about doing it through a cutout, like we were talking about earlier. Okay? Um, the cutout is one of the best ways to do it. Dead drops, it's another good way to do it. You know, um, there's all kinds of modern ways to do this and to maintain secrecy and to maintain um, some level of security, okay? I know y'all probably think with all this digital bullshit out there and all the digital age and all that stuff that it's damn near impossible to not be under surveillance, but I guarantee you it is possible. Okay, you just have to know how and you have to be willing to let go. Okay, have to be willing to let go. That's, that's all I'm going to say about that. All right. So back to it. The other thing they talk about when they talk about using dead drop for cutouts is putting a guy inside of wherever that meeting is going to be where you might leave the dead drop or you might leave the cutout or whatever. Um, putting a guy inside there to watch the comings and goings of that specific person. Okay. Need to look around, need to investigate the inside of the area, um, wherever they're supposed to meet, need to look around for enemies, you need to look around for anything, anything and everything. Okay. Next, Another thing that they do for security measures back in the day was any member of that resistance team, they had to report suspicious activity, no matter what, absolutely anything. And they have to report it immediately. Immediately. Okay? So the second they come into contact with their team, hey, Jason never came to the meeting last night or Jason was supposed to come to my house last night and, you know, talk and he didn't. He never made it. Well, why didn't you come tell me last night? <laughs> okay. So that is absolutely imperative. Okay. It doesn't matter what happens. You got to report that shit right away. Okay. The reason being because back then they may have had a chance to save their guys from the Gestapo. They may have had a chance to go break them out of prison. They may have had a chance to find out where their comrade was being held and go get him. Break him out, okay? Keep in mind, you know, this is World War II Europe, so all kinds of crazy crap is possible. All right? So, um, another thing that the members of that, you know, the, the resistance cell, they're going to need to know um, all kinds of stuff in case of an emergency, right? In case all the members are getting rounded up, 
That's an emergency. Okay? So it's a, it, it's 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 very clear in the documents that I have about what to do in those cases. Um, everybody in the cell, they need to know what kind of signals are going to be used. They need to know where to look for the signals. They need to know how those signals will look. Um, and, and so on. Okay. And, you know, if the leader of that group is smart, if the leader of that cell is smart, he will have a different, uh, sim, uh, signal for an emergency for each member of that organization. So Jason's would be a blue bird. You know, uh, Bob's symbol would be a yellow sign. James's symbol would be a, you know, a tree, you know, like a specific, like a pine tree. You know what I'm saying? Like as soon as they see these symbols, they know something is wrong. Okay. Um, they also need to know what members of their group they need to warn themselves. Okay. So, if I'm the agent that was dropped behind enemy lines, I need to warn James. That's my job, okay? James's job is to warn Jason. Jason's job is to warn Bob. So on and so forth, okay? The next thing they all need to know is where are they going to go when shit's getting bad, right? Where's the, where's the hideout? You know, where's HQ? Where is the safe house, which we're probably going to do an episode on pretty soon here. How to build a safe house, you know, or maybe what they looked like back in the day or I don't know, something like that. We'll see. Okay. Um, the other thing those agents should be thinking about those, you know, those resistance cell teams, each member should be thinking about a cover story for himself. Okay. How is he going to escape and evade? Right. If he has to leave in the middle of the night, does he have a bag, a bug out bag, right? A go bag. Does he have a small bag to take with him? Because you're probably going to need it. Okay. And the last thing those guys would want in those bags would be a weapon because that makes you look like a freaking spy. Okay. So normal stuff in there. Normal, normal stuff. Thank you for all that. I I do appreciate it. Get out of here. Anyways, uh, never mind that. <laughs> um, the next thing that the uh, the resistance team needs to know, every member, is which people he knows that he can no longer talk to, which people he can never talk to again, at least not until the war is over. He also needs to know what daily activities he has to stop doing. You know, do I have to stop going and getting a cup of coffee every morning? Do I have to stop going to the store and getting a, a loaf of bread? And so on and so forth, okay? And then um, one of the biggest things that they need to know, because generally that resistance group is all going to part ways. Everybody's going to go their own way, okay? One of the big, 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 big things they all need to know is how to find each other again, how to reestablish contact, okay? It's extremely important. Now, the organizer or the leader of these resistance cells, they need to prepare plans for those emergencies, um, and they need to plan them as far in advance as they possibly can. If an emergency happens, if an agent finds that they're under surveillance or one of his guys gets arrested or something like that, um, they need to find out right away which people in their group are affected and which places are affected. They need to warn everyone in the group to take their prearranged measures to get the hell out of Dodge. They need to let them know, hey, get the hell out of here, you know, or whatever, whatever you've got prearranged. Um, they need to stop any kind of activity that has been affected. So if the Nazis figured out that you're getting airdrops in the middle of the night, it's got to stop. It's got to stop right now. Okay. Um, 
They also need to sanitize any place that has been affected. So if, you know, if those Gestapo pieces of shit, if they know about the bar that you've been using as an HQ, it's got to get sanitized. It's got to get sanitized like a mug, okay? You need to get rid of any materials, documents, um, gear, anything and everything. It's all got to go, okay? Um, if you can, if you can send a message, they would want them to send a message to the HQ that they had. You know, like, um, if you were a spy working in behind enemy lines, you probably want to send an HQ to, um, MI6, you know, Great Britain. That was most of the guys, or maybe the OSS in, uh, in USA. Okay. Um, another thing, if one of their agents has been arrested, if one of their team members has been arrested, they're going to want to find out the reason why they've been arrested, and they want to find out whether the uh, agent has said anything yet. Granted, they're going to be tortured, you know, back in the day by those piece of crap Nazis, so they need to find out, you know, what has been said, if they can, okay? And, finally, if they can help that agent that got arrested, if they can help him to escape, they should, okay? As long as they don't screw up uh, the security of the organization that they already have, okay? And if, if their organization is extremely secure as it is, they don't want to compromise that any further, or they don't want to compromise that security if they don't have to, okay? So they're going to want to be as secure as possible at all times, but if that's not possible, um, then obviously, you know, that's when you put in the emergency measures. But Sorry, I needed a drink. But if they can get their guys out, then they should. If they can get that guy out that has been compromised or that has been arrested, they should go get that guy. Especially if they can get him before uh, the Gestapo gets him to any kind of a prison. Because remember something else that we talked about during E&E &E and all that stuff. We talked about when you want to escape from captivity. You want to escape when you're in... Uh, the hands of the first people, okay, because the first place, you know, that they take you to is probably going to be for interrogation, that's going to be hard to escape from there, and then the second place they take you to is going to be a prison to hold you indefinitely, okay, and that's going to be even harder to escape from, so the first people you want to escape from are the, are the guards that are holding you, or like the police, or whoever that is that's holding you, you know, in World War II, okay, so, anyways, um, that's going to do it for me for today. I don't have a lot of time left, so I hope you guys enjoyed everything that we were talking about. If you guys have any questions, feel free to email me at gunmetalarmory at gmail.com. Um, I appreciate each and every one of you. I hope you all had a merry, merry Christmas. And uh, don't forget to go to my YouTube channel, and I will let you guys know uh, about the Rumble Odyssey and all the other channels I'm starting, okay? Anyways, take care, and I'll see you next time as we go deeper inside the gunmetal armory. Good night, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time on the gunmetal armory. Thank you for listening to the Prepper Broadcasting Network, where we promote self-reliance and independence. Tune in tomorrow for another great show and visit us at prepperbroadcasting.com.